Hey, I'm Felissa Rose, and you're watching Keto and Crime. Hey, everyone. Welcome to Keto and Crime. Today, I have another Keto and Crime, crime classic for you. Today, we're going to be looking at the case of this man, Ephraim Taylor Jr., who was the child of a Southern... Church of Christ minister who was once a uh, engineer, nuclear technician. This this young man was in quite, quite intelligent. Uh, he appeared on Donnie Deutsch's The Next Big Thing on CNBC as a very young man. He also uh, created video games for himself and his friends as a child, had very successful real businesses that could have literally been that next big thing. But instead, he decided to turn to his his family business of being a minister and basically put in place what can only be described as a church related Ponzi scheme. Much like the Southern Baptist Association of Arizona, we have another church Ponzi scheme. He and his wife uh, lived off the uh, money of hardworking individuals who believed they were putting their money into God's hands to grow for their retirement and ended up losing everything. They basically squandered it on his wife's music videos which you will see in the video he was endorsed by a lot of the biggest african-american televangelists uh, who also ended up having some troubles of their own which i will cover uh, i do plan to cover some uh, scandals in the african-american church going forward and um, so let's just say this is the first one of those i'm adding this to my scuzzy televangelist list to talk about because it's not just uh the, the white Pentecostal church that has this issue, it's all churches. Uh, I think, you know, from us looking at the uh, fundamentalist LDS and others, we can see that all churches, just religious people in general, are all susceptible to this this plague. It's just people. It's not a race thing. It's a, it's a people thing, that there are just bad people in the world, and Ephraim Taylor was one of those. So with that being said, we're going to take a look at one of the very first videos I ever made on white collar crime for this video. Ephraim Taylor Jr. defrauded millions. So I'm going to talk, we're going to talk about the 2015 case of Ephraim Taylor told to you by 2018 Tracy. Here we go. Let's dive in. Keto Comic here with White Collar Crime Wednesday for a very special subscriber. I'm doing the story of Ephraim Taylor Jr. He, I call it Ministry of Deception because that's cheesy and that's just who I am. But um, he's been featured on shows like American Greed, uh, True Crime Daily. This is truly a story of a young man with a bright future that went way wrong. And he used the African-American church or church in general to s basically scam people out of millions of dollars and he ended up in federal prison as a result out of millions of dollars and uh, I believe coming in second only to people that hurt children and elderly people physically mentally what have you is people that use religion to take advantage of others because religion even though I'm not religious myself religion is a very important part of a lot of people's lives and when someone uses it to get rich and scam people really irritates me so this is a pretty interesting case so let's get into it shall we Ephraim Taylor Jr. was born July 27th 1982 to a Mr. and Mrs. Ephraim Taylor Sr. in Fort Gibson Mississippi now I could not find the name of Ephraim's mom uh, that's pretty well guarded. I'm sure it's somewhere in some court records, but as deep as I dug, I could not find it. But uh, one thing I think ev in every public record, they're simply referred to as Mr. and Mrs. Ephraim Taylor Sr. or the Reverend and Mrs. Ephraim Taylor Sr., which is not unusual given the denomination they were a part of. But he was born in Fort Gibson, Mississippi. At that time, he was an engine. Uh, his father, the father, Ephraim Senior, was an engineer at a nuclear power plant. His wife was a homemaker. They eventually moved to Decatur, Alabama, and then later on to Overland Park and Kansas City, Kansas, where he took over a Church of Christ as senior pastor. Now, being that he was part of the Church of Christ, 
there's no wonder that everyone refers to them as Mr. and Mrs. or Reverend and Mrs. because I don't know if you know much about the Church of Christ. I grew up in a very fundamentalist Pentecostal tradition. Church of Christ is probably even more fundamentalist than the Pentecostal tradition. Uh, a lot of, they don't use instrumental music. They uh, have very distinct roles for genders. Uh, the man is definitely head of the household. Um, they're very much biblical literalists. So it's a very strict environment. So that's why it doesn't surprise me that I could not find her name anywhere because she would not in that tradition be identified outside her marriage. So, and I don't mean to insult any of my listeners that may be Church of Christ. I doubt there's very few of you out there that are listening to drama channels if you are Church of Christ. But, so that doesn't surprise me. So, he grew up uh, in a multi-child household with very strict parents. They did educate them in public school. Uh, there wasn't a whole lot of money because he gave up being an engineer. The father gave up being an engineer and became a full-time minister. So his salary was definitely dependent on donations and tithes coming in from members of the church. But, um, so they were very frugal. And it was this frugality that led to Ephraim's first foray into the world of being an entrepreneur. And like I said earlier, this is a very sad story for a lot of people because you had a very bright young mind that just got turned the wrong way. And uh, this photo here is Ephraim and his wife, Michelle, who becomes a integral player in the story a little bit later on. But let's keep going. Okay. When Ephraim was 11 years old, well, actually, when he was nine, he really got into video games, played them constantly, became very good at them, and then went to his parents and asked for a new game, as children can t tend to do. They told him they would not spend 40 or $50 on a new game, and maybe he should just create his own. And you know what? Unlike a lot of kids, he did. He created his own video game. He played it. He enjoyed it. He perfected it. And then he started making them in bulk, you know, making four or five at a time and selling them to kids at school. So he created his first business by the time he was 12. And he was actually making enough money to not only help the family, but also pay for everything that a, that a kid could want as far as being a kid. So he had it made. He kind of got out of the video game world and kind of went into the, this is about the time the uh, internet was becoming a thing. You know, I know a lot of us can't remember a time when it wasn't a thing, but I grew up in the 80s, and I can tell you it wasn't always a thing. The last part of the 90s, early 2000s, when he was 16, he developed a job hunting site for teens where he charged companies to place ads and charged teens a membership fee to find summer jobs, permanent jobs, college jobs, whatever whatever they might. And he actually came up with this idea while he was attending classes at the prestigious Kaufman Center for Entrepreneurial Leadership in Kansas City, Kansas. He came up with this idea why there and actually marketed it and actually it started making a lot of money because companies bought into it and used it to recruit bright young minds. And Ephraim Taylor, by the time he was 19, was a millionaire. A lot of people say multimillionaire, but I couldn't really find a whole lot of um, information on exactly how much money GoFair it was worth, but it was a lot. And he won a uh, prestigious Microsoft award in the year 2000 at the Microsoft uh, Teen Challenge with GoFair. And after that, of course, he had tech companies wanting to buy it from him, and eventually he did sell it. So by the age of 19, he was completely retired from the tech industry. Yeah. He had actually married his wife, Michelle, who was born in Overland Park, Paris, June 25th, 1984, uh, just prior to uh, retiring. And he did just want to retire. He just wanted to retire, do some speaking engagements and things like that. But Michelle had other ideas for him. She was an aspiring pop singer and wanted him to basically fund her career, help her get studio time, buy airtime, you know, 
do videos, whatever. And he really liked that idea of being able to, again, use his brain, use the, the talents and gifts he had to help her. So they went full force into that. He did retire, as I said, from the tech industry, but he kind of stayed alive by doing interviews. He did speaking engagements uh, all over. By this time, they had they were still in Kansas, but had, but had bought a second home in Atlanta, Georgia, which will become very, very uh, important to the story. So he started speaking not only at civic organizations, tech conferences. He was a uh, a regular member of the panel on Donnie Deutsch's Next Big Idea on CNBC, which is a huge uh, show that showcases entrepreneurs and people that had big ideas. He was a regular guest there. So he was he was doing the speaking circuit and still making a lot of money doing that. But that was in no way enough to fund both the lifestyle, the up, very upper middle class, comfortable lifestyle they had become accustomed to and fund Michelle's music career. So they came up with a less than kosher idea. And let's get into that. While living part-time in Atlanta, they had become acquainted with Bishop Eddie Long of the New Birth Church in Atlanta. Uh, if you Google Bishop Eddie Long, you'll see a ton of, like, bad stuff. Uh, he's, not a, he's not a saint by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, there's been a lot of scandal at his church, both sexual and physical, as far as money. Uh, he was accused, he's a very... As a gay person, I don't really care for Bishop Long because he does spout a lot of anti-homosexual rhetoric and breed a lot of hate in the church, in my opinion. And in 2012, way after this Ephraim Taylor story broke, he was accused of basically being in a uh, inappropriate relationship with male members of his church. And this is Bishop Long here. And this is him, I guess, after some weight loss in gym, as you, as you can see. But he, but he was accused of being uh, very uh, inappropriate with some male member, young male members of his church. I'm not saying it was a, it, it wasn't like a predator situation, but these were young, young men, you know, at least 18, that he kind of sent inappropriate pictures to. So his church has been you know, rife with scandal. So it was actually the perfect breeding ground for what Ephraim Taylor would do. So Ephraim Taylor and his wife joined New Birth Church around 2007. And because of his success, people were, were always asking him, how did you do what you did? And instead of telling them about his tech experience and how he sold a company and how he did speaking engagements, he began to lead people to thinking that he had this wonderful investment opportunity mm -hmm. that no one else knew about and how it was Christian based and how you could get guaranteed 20% returns on your money if you just invested in it. And he started talking about that around the church. And of course, Bishop Long got wind of it and decided to actually give him a platform to talk about this investment opportunity at the church. Man, keep standing on your feet. They told me before I get up here, they don't come up here all week. You got to be crunk when you come to new birth. And I said, all right, I want to see what I can do. I've still got a little bit of youth on me. Let's keep it crunk. Now, I think y'all got this song here. I was hanging out on YouTube before I came. I was like, well, I need to see what type of congregation the new birth is. And you know when you type in Eddie Long or New Birth on YouTube, you know what the first video is that comes up, right? Cross it up! Play that song! Oh, I think it's time to cross it up right now because I believe that many of us are thinking that we are in some type of dark time, as they would say, that there is a recession that is going on, but I believe for the people of God, especially on this morning, especially for those of you that woke up this morning, put on your clothes to get all looking good and smelling good, got in your nice... As you can see, he was a great speaker because he had honed his skills from 
basically doing the speaker circuit for four or five years because there was quite a span of time between the time he retired from the tech industry, started doing speaking engagements, and when they joined New Birth. So as you can see in the great African-American church tradition, it's, it was a lot of music, a lot of inspirational, you know, more of a, more of an, uh, a motivational speaker. That's kind of the case with most mega churches like New Birth Church. If you ever watched New Birth's broadcast or you've ever watched uh, Joel uh, Olstein or uh, any of the mega church models, even like the Crystal Cathedral, which was a big one when I was a kid, they're more motivational speakers than pastors and they really get their crowd pumped up and that's how they're able to get the amount of money out of their congregants that they do and he was no different so eddie long started letting him speak at the church as you can see he, he could have been a pastor i mean he'd been around it his whole life with his father being a pastor and watching bishop long do it he could have very well used his used his talent for good but he started talking about this investment opportunity that was no more than a classic Ponzi scheme. And if you don't know what a Ponzi scheme is, it was uh, kind of coined based on Charles Ponzi back in the 1920s, basically. It's a scheme where there's nothing but money coming in. There is no investment. There is no interest being earned. There is nothing but money and the word of the person taking the money. So basically, you promise people exorbitant returns and when i say 20 percent that is exorbitant you should never expect a 20 percent return on any investment the norm on savings accounts is like one to two percent return per year the norm on most traditional wall street investments is three to five percent that's the norm so if you have an investment that's beating that legitimately considered a great investment but no one, no one except maybe two people in the whole history of investment have ever beat inv the numbers by that much. But yet he was promising people a 20% return on all the money they invested in this. So that's what Charles Ponzi did way back in the 20s. He promised people exorbitant returns. He would take in their money and then use the money taken in from new investors to pay the returns on the old investors so you can see how how this is a house of cards how a ponzi scheme if you don't have more money coming in than it's going out it's going to collapse on itself and that's what normally happens and that's what happened here but he was promising people that he was taking their money and he was investing in it into poor neighborhoods businesses and poor predominantly African-American neighborhoods because these, this was an African-American church and he would change that story when he went to other mega churches because he also spoke at Joel Osteen's church. He spoke at some other mega churches that had a more, uh, you know, a different race makeup basically. And he would tell, you know, this church, it was all for African-American neighborhoods. He would tell this church, it was just for poor neighborhoods in general. And he would tell this church, it was for Latina neighborhoods. So just, I mean, Latino neighborhoods. So just, keep that in mind and what he would do he said he was taking this money and helping the small business people he was investing in things like convenience stores gas stations uh, affordable housing uh, mom and pop corner stores you you get it you know building a real neighbor helping these neighborhoods build themselves up and he was investing this money into those things and your returns would come from those businesses thriving well there were no businesses that were being invested in instead he was using the church the church people's money and it's estimated he was able to bilk people in a estimation of 12 to 15 million dollars across several churches new new birth being the his prime target because that's where he had the biggest platform but where was this money going you say instead of just funding a lavish lifestyle let me show you where this money is going. Remember Michelle? Michelle was an aspiring pop singer. A lot of it was going to funding her career. So let's take a look at where these parishioners' money was going. There's the apron. I'ma make the boys say damn, bet you wanna know who the I am So killer and my walk is mean, all of the girls wanna be like me I'm sexy, I'm perfection 
that's where their money was going. And not only was it not very good music and didn't go anywhere, it was literally, that was a song called Billionaire. It was literally taking it and rubbing it in their faces. You know, we're millionaires, look how we live on your money. So that's the reason I have no respect for Michelle Taylor at all and very little for um, Ephraim. He's a grown man. He can make his own decisions, but I think he was a lot under her thumb. But that's where the money was going. And that's another thing that gets me. He propagated the scam on being a Christian and being a religious man, but yet his wife is making music like that, which is obviously worldly in the view of the church. So I don't get why people fell for this. But again, you see the kind of energy that gets going at those sermons, you know, it's easy for anyone to get caught up in it, I suppose. I don't know if there's anybody that is a member or, or has been a member of a mega church that wants to comment on that. Please do below because I find it an interesting phenomenon. But anyway, he lived the high life from like 2007 till about 2010 on other people's money. He was constantly going from church to church, bringing in more money to pay the investors back i mean he was paying some of his investors back and they were getting their 20 percent because he had to do had to to keep the scheme going but eventually people stopped giving as much and he came into dire straits and then there were some other other improprieties that happened with new birth that he got caught up in and so there was an investigation that was prompted into all of new births financial dealings in 2010 because there was some financial improprieties there as far as what they were paying, what was tax exempt versus what wasn't, what Bishop Long was doing with his salary. So it all just kind of morphed into a perfect storm. So Ephraim and Michelle got investigated along with New Birth. And as part of for what they found, because they found no record of any investments in any small businesses in any city USA, the Securities and Exchange Commission, SEC, filed official charges against Ephraim and Michelle Taylor, or just Ephraim, really, because he was the only one that signed anything, of course, official charges against them in 2010. So the whole thing just started to unravel. And then people realized, hey, I'm not getting my returns. People started to complain. More charges, more improprieties came out. And finally, Bishop Long himself realized he had been scammed, his parishioners had been scammed, and he actually, in 2011, made a public a YouTube video begging Ephraim to return the money to his parishioners, even if without the return, just return their money. So let's take a look at that. Long, and I just want to come to you for a few moments to uh, let you know about a situation that we have and one that touches my heart deeply and one that I am working along with my parishioners and my leaders to resolve. Uh, a couple of years ago, about a year ago, we had a financial seminar here at the church and we do many financial seminars and other people that we bring into the congregation to help empower the congregation, help empower the community. We've been known for bringing major speakers from around the world for empowerment, to strengthen so there'd be a better quality of life. And we have more productive citizens, people who can help others. So with all that, we had city capital come in, Mr. Ephraim Taylor, who came in and ran a wonderful seminar for us. But at the same time, we found out later that some of our members had made some investments in IRAs, retirement accounts, through his business. And through that, uh, collectively, about a million dollars has been not returned. The investment has gone sour. And I'm making an appeal because once they shared with me the hardship, once they shared with me what's going on with their families, and I just, my, I am a pastor. I have compassion for people. My whole life is dedicated to helping people establish them, establish a legacy for them to pass on to their children's children. I have made appeals to Mr. Taylor. I've made appeals to City Capitol. And I'm asking you to join with me to make an appeal to Ephraim Taylor and City Capitol that they would return as soon as possible. The and there you go. So by 2011, Ephraim was completely cut loose from his mentor, Eddie Long. So, of course, the money, some of the money was recovered, but of course, there's still a lot of it outstanding. Uh, Michelle and Ephraim kind of went into hiding. Um, after that, they, of course, all their property was seized and sold to, to repay their debts, but then they took off and left Atlanta and went back to Kansas City, Kansas, and there they 
actually opened up a spa and massage parlor for a little while, and that's where they what they did to make ends meet um, in, in the Kansas and Missouri area there until 2015 when his trial finally concluded and he was sentenced to 20 years in federal prison for wire fraud, for embezzlement, and for just operating a Ponzi scheme in general. And um, he was sentenced to paying back $15.6 million in retributions upon his release. So that's where it stands. He's in prison. Michelle still lives in the Kansas area. I think they did close down their spa business. I'm not sure exactly what she does. I didn't want people to go out and try to find her, so I'm not going to put any other. But she's still in the Kansas, Missouri area, uh, probably just doing what she can to scrape by. And he's sitting in federal prison. So that's where it stands. There's still thousands of people that have not received their money back and honestly probably never will because what's going to happen? He's going to file bankruptcy and it'll never be recovered because he doesn't have it. It's like literally getting blood out of the perpetual turnip. You can't do it. So that's pretty much where this story ends. I know it's not as in-depth or as long as my normal ones, but there really wasn't a whole lot to it. I mean, he was very young when this happened. He was in his late 20s, early 30s when he started this scam and was in jail by his late 30s. So there really wasn't a whole lot of history. And actually about half of his life was legitimate businesses that made him money. And so he just got pulled down the wrong track. I don't want to blame it all on his wife. But I think she had a lot to do with it. Just from her attitude, I've seen in interviews and stuff, she doesn't seem like a person that's satisfied with just having a normal standard of living. Um, so I think he got pulled down a bad path. But this is pretty simple Ponzi scheme. I mean, they're simple. As bad as they are, they're simple. You just take in money, as much money as you can, use it to pay off investors that are due their payments, and then you bring in more money to pay off the next ones. And it's kind of simple in its format, even though it's general. So. And he used the African-American church to do it. And he's not the only one that's ever done that. We're, we're going to get into some more that have used the church to kind of defraud people. I think mega churches in general have a sketchy sketchy rapport with their, with their parishioners. But the fact this was tied to a mega church just made it even more interesting. But anyway. That's the, that's the scoop on Ephraim Taylor uh, Jr. His father is still a pastor of a, the Church of Christ pastor, still, I believe, in Shawnee, uh, Kansas, and uh, has not really made any public comment other than he supports his son, and that's what I would expect from a father. So that's where it stands. I hope you enjoyed this White Collar Crime Wednesday. Ephraim Taylor, my spe very special subscriber, you know who you are. This was for you. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it did. I did it justice. And I'll be back next Wednesday with another white collar crime video. I'll be back this week with more reactions, more keto videos. Like, comment, subscribe. Check out my comedy album below. Check out some merch if you want to help me keep the uh, be able to afford better equipment and stuff. That's always great. But I'm not going anywhere. I'll continue to pump out these videos because I enjoy doing them. Thank you so much. Ketosis, y'all. Keto comic out. Thank you.